Something is going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day fans and welcome back on this cold and wet and miserable night for some exciting nerdy talk. How good is this? I'm here tonight with my best buddies, MPS and Jeffro. Lads, how are we all? Good. good dude. How's everyone else? I'm going to hand the microphone over to my dude who's going to be discussing our first presentation of the night, hey. Hannah Barbera. So uh, something a little bit different for everybody out there and hopefully you'll learn something new about um, the, the production company. So I'm going to pass over to MPS and uh, off you go, sir. Look, we're going to maybe do a bit of a drinking game for every voice I do. As you know, you should be having a drink, and by the time you've, we've done this presentation, you guys will probably be drunk uh, because there's quite a few voices in here that are fun to do. So, uh, look, Hanna-Barbera, there are the four different production uh, logos that have come out over the years. I remember the, the bottom one, this one more than anything else, because uh, I watched a lot of repeats uh, of the show's back in the late 70s, early 80s, and I think they stopped repeating them probably late 80s, uh, you know, the, the shows that we're going to discuss. I'm also going to discuss tonight the ones that I remember for the most part. There's a couple in there I don't really remember, but I did watch them, uh, and I'm not going into too much detail with them, uh, and you guys can all jump in when you want to, uh, because this is a, a bit of an interesting company. So the two guys that created it were William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, including Sydney, uh, George Sydney. And that's Sydney with a S-I-D-N-E-Y, not S-Y-D, like is in, in New South Wales or Sydney. Uh, they created that uh, July 7, 1957, so that was 62 years ago. And technically, the company, after a couple of um, changes of hands and being merged with Time Warner and, and Warner Brothers Animation and that sort of thing, officially was defunct as of 2001. So it had it had about, well, they're classing 60, oh, what is it, 50 odd years of, of, of productions. And in that production time, oh, I tell you what, let's have a bit of a look here. Some of these you'll know, some of these you might not remember. Uh, there are also lots of breakaways. So Scooby-Doo had about six or seven or eight different versions of it throughout the years. The Flintstones before The Simpsons was the longest running cartoon at six years. So I think they did... Uh, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers. It was 150-odd-plus episodes over six years. Everyone sort of should know the Smurfs, Jabberjaw, Hong Kong Fooey, Pixie Dixie, Oggy Doggy and Doggy Daddy, <coughs> Top Cat and the guys from there, uh, Pixie Dixie and Mr. Jinx, if I remember the cat's name correctly. You're right. <laughs> And there was a whole bunch of others. Uh, there was a lot of different genres. And this is what made this presentation really difficult for me because I could go with, um, and I'm basically going to go with the sci-fi sort of stuff because that's what we're sort of talking about more. But there was, you know, like Angers just mentioned, Huckleberry Hound. Uh, there was Shirt Tales. There was a whole lot of animals that were sort of doing them uh, in terms of characters sort of stuff. And there's a couple that I'll, I'll describe in here as well. Uh, to give you an idea... They, they did 200 TV shows. This is the list of, well, as you can see, there's a there's a second page to it, but that's what they created. Uh, and if you have a look at that list, some of these were in the 90s, and I'll give you some really weird examples. After the film, they then went and did Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, the TV series, in animated form. Uh they did a series of Genie, which is based on I Dream of Genie. They did the Gary Coleman show. They did, uh, where is it? Uh, Laurel and Hardy. They did a Laurel and Hardy cartoon. You know, they did a lot of stuff. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different Scooby, nine different Scooby Doo shows. Uh, they did a whole a whole range of things over the years. They did the Dukes, which is based on the Dukes of Hazard. They did a Dumb and Dumber series. Uh, they also did things like um, Dexter's Laboratory. Uh, what else? Pol uh, Fish Police. Um, 
the Fonz and the Happy Days gang, they they just they were everywhere essentially. They were probably the biggest Mork and Mindy, Laverne and Shirley and the Fonzie Hour. You know, where would you come up with this for cartoons? You know, this is just crazy sort of stuff. Uh Laverne and Shirley TV series. There's a bunch of Super Friends versions of Super Friends. They did one on the Harlem Globetrotters. Mm -hmm. They did a uh, Musketeers series. Um, it's just, it's insane. But one of the first ones I remember was Adam Ant. And if you remember his catchphrase was, up and Adam, Adam Ant. And he would take off and, and do his thing where he would, save the uh the <laughs> save the day essentially most of these are all hero uh sort of shows um based on certain elements and we'll go through some of those later on secret screw which obviously is a spy one and i love secret screw and morocco mole you know you have these two well the secret screw, secret screw and there is a, a few of them that are bumbling sort of like the get smarts of, of the comic and cartoon age uh, and then they come out as sort of uh their sidekicks sort of save the day mighty mitor so a lot of these shows also had the three cartoon series so basically in a 30 minute television slot they would have three different six to eight minute cartoons so you would have say two of mighty mitor and one of moby dick so the first episode might be Mighty My Tour or Space Ghost, and the next one would be something else, and the third one would be back to the first one. So there wasn't a range, like very few of these series lasted that long. There might have been a season or two, uh, but they were consistent. And, and thinking about it over the week, I don't recall seeing many double-ups, but yet there might have only been 15 or 20 sort of episodes done. But over the years, I've seen them all somewhere, but just don't remember them because there were so many of these things. Um, Moby Dick was a giant white whale, obviously, and he had the two kids who I don't remember much of them. But Mighty Mitor, if you have a look at the side pictures where he puts up the the um, the club and becomes uh, Mitor, and then he can fly with the dragon, and then the kid can fly as well, emulating the, the hero of the time. The Jetsons, we jump to a futuristic world where George Jetson, Jane, his wife, daughter, Judy, Elroy. Uh, do you remember the, the robot name? Rosie. Rosie, very good. And the dog? Astro. Astro. And where did he work? Uh, Spacely Sprockets. Very good. Now, here's some interesting reading that I, that I caught up with on this. Um, in the show, George Jetson's 40, Jane's meant to be 33, and yet Judy is 18. And you go, well, the numbers just add up sort of thing. But, you know, for that time period, that was acceptable. That was the sort of thing. But it just, when you look at the numbers, no one ever sort of um, thinks about their age, do they? You know, obviously... That, that Elroy's a kid, you know, Judy's in high school, you know, but you never sort of think that George and, and Jane are, are that far apart. You you know, you think, oh, yeah, they're a couple of years sort of thing. They might have gone to school together or whatever. Just interesting things that you find when you do research. It's the future, you see, because currently a lot of um, uh, people are having kids when they're older, but uh, clearly with uh, when we get to the future of the Jetsons, it'll be completely reversed and having them young, that's the way to go. So there you go. Well, it'll be young like it was back in the 60s and 70s. You know, m most people sort of had younger, were younger at the time. So Johnny Quest, not one that I watched, but I know there are a lot of fans out there. Uh, I don't, yeah, yeah. So you guys can talk about Johnny Quest for a second. What do you remember about it? Well, Jeff, Johnny, Quest, Johnny Quest was one of those ones where it was shown in prime time in America and it was probably the most expensive project that uh, Hanna-Barbera had undertaken at that time. So right from the get-go with the theme from Hoist Axton, you just knew that you were in for a, a great adventure. And uh, uh, 
out of all the Hanna Barbera shows, I think apart from Scooby Doo, Johnny Quest has the biggest fan following, and um, over the years they have uh, remade it, and um, it's just it's it's a really adult concept, and these the stories are just you know just full of action, and and you get to love the characters. Uh, and I just think everything about it worked and uh, uh, they moved away from the usual style and they got, um, uh, what's his name, um, Alex Toff, is that the uh, the comic book artist? He did all the uh, pre-production drawings and they used his um, artwork to be able to sort of bring that to look like a, uh, a serious comic book to the screen. Mm. I just I don't remember much of it at all, but I do remember watching it and really enjoying it. And I think, as Jeffro said, because it was a bit more adult rather than just uh, silly. Um, and as uh, even PJ has mentioned there, it looks a bit tin tinnish, and I guess it kind of was to a large degree. I just remember it just sort of worked for me. So, uh, but uh, I haven't seen an episode in decades. So, mm. uh, as we mentioned before, Scooby Doo, and there was what eight different versions of it, including the Scooby Doo Dino Mutt Hour. Now it's funny because Dino Mutt is the sidekick to blue falcon so blue falcon's the hero he's the one trying to do all the hero stuff very similar to batman and bruce wayne uh in his big blue blue suit and you've got dino mutt who if you check out the picture on the top left where his head's all sort of inspector gadget ish that was way before inspector gadget's time so you know he was a robotic dog uh and you know at times malfunctioned very much like Inspector Gadget did and probably that's what um, uh, they got the idea for in terms of Inspector Gadget with some of those sort of things. But uh, yeah, Dino Mutt was a bit of a doofus, really, one of those things, but he would sit there and go, Blue Falcon and Dog Wonder! Oh, hey! <laughs> Take a drink. I remember the Falcon car. I love it. I love this show. This was great. This was very Batman-ish for me for when Batman wasn't around. I like um, just uh, quickly uh, Ads's comment up there about Johnny Quest making a. You'd have to go back to the slide. Johnny Quest making a good live action movie. Yeah, probably would actually. So, although probably is that when you make a movie like that, a lot of people would say, "Oh, this has just been copied from this, that, and everything else." Even though those things may have copied Johnny Quest. So, but uh, I tend to agree. I think it would actually do quite well. Or a really high end animated film like Tintin was the Spielberg yeah. version. So there you go. Anyway, continue on. Uh, Suzanne. Now, Shazam was a uh, genie, essentially, mm -hmm. and not Shazam, as we all thought it was, but it was Shazam. And I can't remember the two kids' names, but uh, and I've just gone blank on the... Kabuki was the camel. He was a flying camel. So instead of having a flying carpet, you had flying camel. As you do. As you do. And the kids would always get into trouble, and Shazam would always sort of find a way to get them out or, you know, do whatever a genie does. Frankenstein Jr. and the Impossibles. Yeah. This was always a bit of a fun one. Um, now this, I think the, the stories were, were two on Frankie Jr. and one on the Impossibles. Uh, Frankie Jr. obviously based on Frankenstein and his monster. Um, Buzz, who's the kid, and Professor Conroy was the one that created Frankenstein Jr. and they saved the day again, sort of thing. So like I said before, they're all hero ones. Uh, the Impossibles were a rock band. And when they weren't a rock band, they were Coil Man and um, uh, Multi Man and Fluid Man. Like, you couldn't have picked weirder, stranger names, could you? You know, Coil Man, because he's got, you know, can spring into action and has got the coils. Multi Man, who would sort of just go bang, 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 and just beat thousands of the guy. And Fluid Man, who just turned into water. So, um, on a night like tonight, Fluid Man probably be a lot more like Ice Man. He'd be frozen. So, ah, <laughs> oh, Birdman and the Galaxy Tree. I'll get to the Galaxy Tree in a second, but Birdman was another one of my favourites, and his big giant eagle Avenger. Do you guys remember his call, his catchphrase? Birdman. Yeah, he come flying out of the the volcano lair that he had, uh, and his powers were from the sun. So if he was under underground for too long, he would be out of action. What about, to... what about Sorry? tonight? What about tonight? Outside, so he'd be stuffed, wouldn't he? Yeah, he's, he's kind of, his solar power, his solar panels wouldn't work, so he'd be kind of screwed. Avenger would have to come and save the day like he did. 
like some of these series, he had teenage sidekicks. Uh, he had Bird Boy, and I think there was Bird Girl as well. Um, oh, no, I didn't put any other pictures up. I thought there was another one. Uh, but he lived in a lair that was a, a carved-out volcano. It's like Dr. Evil. I've got a volcano lair. It's just... <laughs> Um, and it was funny because he wasn't the bad guy and he had a volcano there, which was really cool. Captain Caveman and the Teen Angels, another one of my favorites. You know, I've got to do it and I've got to do it loud and it's going to be real. I might go back a bit where he would just make his call of Captain Caveman. Gotta love these shows with these big, crazy. <laughs> Imagine the guys. And I heard stories about some of the ones, some of the, um, voice actors at Warner Brothers who they put the animation people down the bottom of the studio, like towards the back where no one could sort of hear them because they were crazy. And it was a lot of these voice guys and girls that were doing it. Um, the interesting thing too is, you know how Mel Blanks did the voices for most of the Looney Tunes characters? He also did a, a few of the voices for these sort of characters. And I can't remember which ones exactly, but there was a couple of him. Casey Kasem did voices. Uh, if you remember him from American Top 40. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else. There was another name in there that did voices. But KV was a good one. He was another sort of primitive superhero. His club was sort of like a utility belt. If he needed a torch, he'd, he'd open it up and the bird would, would shine a, a candle. You know, just primitive, crazy kid stuff, which was kind of funny. And if you have a look down the bottom picture in the, the Teen Angels van, he's got his little rock house on top of it. Uh, and I think by day he was a reporter. He'd have glasses on. <laughs> not that the hairy facade was sort of <laughs> a hairy a hairy journalist there you go space ghost probably one of my favorites out of all of these uh and probably the only one that i've actually got a little bit of memorabilia for because there wasn't a lot of stuff made for this sort of thing and not a lot of collectibles made over the years space ghost uh had the two twins jan and jace and blip um Basically, when they created Space Ghost, what they did is they said, make Batman in space. And this is what they came up with. And it was a pretty good concept. Phantom Cruiser, which is the Space Ghost vehicle. It's a really unusual shape. You don't sort of see that very often. It looks more like a fish than a, and it should be underwater than, than in space. Uh, his, uh, his wristbands that could do all sorts of things, turn him invisible or whatever the case was. Even to the point where... Blip was so smart that he rescued the day at, at times when Space Ghost would get captured. Um, yeah, I like how you said, sorry, I like how you said he was supposed to, they said, uh, just copy Batman. So Batman, who these days is wearing all black and you've got Space Ghost is wearing all white, you can't get more copying than that. It was like the exact opposites when you think about it. Well, I think they did the, in all white because if he's in space, if yeah. he was black, he'd be invisible anyway. Uh, and if you have a look at the middle picture where he's invisible... You know, you didn't doesn't really matter what color sort of wears, but I think that was the, the kind of idea that they went with that. Uh, they released the origin story of Space Ghost in a comic book about four, five or six years ago. It was very interesting to sort of read. It's a it's a one shot uh, comic book on on Space Ghost, uh, and I think that was a DC publication. DC also did a publication with all of these guys, uh, and it was called Future Quest, uh, and they pulled out a lot of these characters. It was Johnny Quest who was on this quest to do whatever it was. Space Ghost turns up. Um, the Herculoids turn up. All sorts of, all these characters just come out of nowhere and actually have to help figure out this time shift that occurs. So a vortex ensues, essentially. Um, yeah, but this was, again, one of my favorites. Another one of my favorites was the Wacky Racers. You got all of these cool vehicles. You got the big bad guy Dick Darcy and his double zero at the top in purple. Professor Pat Pending, uh, the Arkansas Chugalug, uh, the Ant Hill Mob, Peter Perfect, Penelope Pitstop. Um, okay. Sorry, I was about to keep going, Jeffo. Yeah, so you got the gruesome twosome up the top there on the top yeah. right. I was going to ask. I mean, they always seem to be racing. What were the races? I mean, like, like. But did they ever finish? <laughs> yeah, they did. And the idea was that someone would finish, but Dick Darcy was always trying to uh, win. You know, he would always start at the back or start at the front or whatever. He always tried to win. And 
he never did. It was kind of like the Roadrunner and the Coyote. You know, you never really catch the, the Coyote, uh, the Roadrunner sort of thing. So, but yeah, and Michelle, you're right. Muttley would sit there and the, every time Dick Dastley screwed up, he'd just sit there and go, <laughs> and laugh as he did, which was awesome. Um, from this, now, like I mentioned with Scooby-Doo, there was a bunch of different versions of Scooby-Doo and Super Friends and all that sort of stuff. This actually broke away into two different series. Broke away into Dastardly and Muttley and their flying machines, which was also known as Stop That Pigeon. Mm. Okay, which only for the fact that it was on is why I watched it. Um, if you check out the bottom right-hand corner where they've got the giant slingshot, basically you've got four incompetent people trying to stop a carrier pigeon. Like, they tried everything. Um, and the pigeon was always much smarter than them. You always seemed to escape drop the mail off, do whatever the case was. But my favourite one was The Perils of Penelope Pistop. Now, that's a bit of a tongue twister at the best of times. But she was always saved by the Ant Hill mob. And when you got, you know, the likes of, of those guys, including Dum Dum, who would always turn around and say, <laughs> Penelope's going to die. <laughs> it didn't matter how bad the situation was. Dum Dum just couldn't... He was always... So like happy, if you will, you know, uh, and they would, he, she was always, she had a protector. So if the guy in the top, top left-hand corner, Jeffrey, do you remember his name? Uh, Paul Lynn's character. Yes. Uh, no, uh, cause I've just drawn a blank. Why? <laughs> but, uh, she, he always had the protector on one side who also was the hooded claw. He was the bad guy. And as you said, that was the voice of the hooded claw and what other series was he from dude this one should be an easy one for you to me oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, i'll even give you a clue actually, actually oh, you guys had... sorry hang on Jeff. maybe sorry Jeff, what was that man yeah it was the paul lynn show that's my that's my answer to that one yeah i'm gonna give it out to the people watching what other show was he in that had his famous voice because once i knew or i saw oh very good Ange, very good he was the goofy uncle in bewitched ah oh, i so wouldn't have known that <laughs> well that's the funny thing i i never realized that the two were the same person and all of a sudden one day i heard him on an episode of bewitched and then that sort of kicked in and i watched the trailer for the or the opening for the show and it was him. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. That was awesome. So, uh, yeah, he was the good guy and the bad guy in the same thing because Penelope was a, a an heiress of sorts and he was just trying to get his uh, slice of her money, essentially, and tried to put her in all sorts of predicaments where he would tie her up in in um, on train tracks and do all sorts of stuff. And the Ant Hill mob uh, with Chuggalug would, would come and save the day. Tell you what, you've done well with the answers because people are popping them everywhere. Bewitched, bewitched, bewitched. You know, Uncle Arthur this, Uncle Arthur. you got everybody switched on, that's for sure. Yeah. It's funny because when you go and watch an episode of Bewitched, if you go and watch an episode of, of this, all you do is you hear his voice, you know, in this cartoon. And, you know, I hadn't known that for years. And yet you're watching Bewitched and episodes of, of this at the same time and, and never put the two together. So, but there you go. And I think on that note, we might end it, unless you guys have got uh, any comments, questions, or, or stuff. Like I said, this was a, just a few of the shows that I watched um, because they just happened to be on, really. They were the, the stuff on, on you know, first thing in the morning from 6 a.m. On, on either Channel 10 or Channel 7, whatever it was, uh, till about 9 o'clock when you had to go to school, you know. And we're only talking Hanna-Barbera. We're not talking all the other cartoons that were out and all that sort of stuff. So, um yeah, Hanna Barbera does have a bit of a special uh, place in 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 my heart because of all the all the stuff that I used to watch as a kid. Very very cool. All right. So anyway, look, it's it's time for us uh, to finish up on this cold and wet and miserable night. Uh, we did get some feedback in regards to uh, a different day for this show to be on. Uh, so the lads and myself will discuss our options and we'll see where the wind takes us. In the interim, though, it's a Friday night. Go back to bed. Curl up with a good nerd and um, watch some TV shows and whatever else. And we will leave you all to it. 
So until next Friday, when we're back again, at least we're on Friday for the time being, stay nerdy. There you go.